Brothers and sisters, and a warm welcome to our non Muslim guests in the audience today. So, as um, the MC mentioned, this talk is titled Islam the origin of women's liberation. This topic that we're going to address today comes at a time where Islam generally and Muslim women specifically have made headlines. And I, I don't know how else to exaggerate that, but we know it. Um, oppressed, inferior to men, deprived of identity, forced by the Sharia, treated as class, second class citizens and cut off from social life are just about a few of the labels and imagery which have been stamped onto the minds of people when they think of the lives of Muslim women. Ideas implanted by opportunistic politicians and further reinforced by the media. In a climate where Muslims face an uphill struggle in, in maintaining their Islamic identity and protecting its funda fundamental aspects of faith, we still find that here, even in Western societies, that people are interested in Islam and most and some of them are even embracing and converting into Islam. I know that yesterday there was a reverts panel, you know, people discussing and explaining their journeys to Islam. And also a growing number of women, Muslim women, are proudly and defiantly wearing the hijab and the jilbab or, the, or the, even the niqab, despite the liberal environments these, Muslim, these women live in. And what is apparent is that when we do delve into the discourse of all things to do with you know, women's liberation or gender equality is that the success and the progress of women has only been measured by the Western secular liberal yardstick. And you know, subhanAllah, when I was um, asked to do this talk, I thought, what a very, I, I love the title of the talk. It was, I really, I find it so suitable to what we're trying to aim and propose for today because essentially what we are hoping to do today is to take a step forward and to shift the discussion into a new direction. We are not here to simply discuss Muslim women within the parameters that already exist, but we are, all, we are here to propose and open up an idea that, despite all the noise that government policies and media try to make, that Islam poses as the only viable and contending alternative system which will champion the rights of not just Muslim women, but for all women. Islam is not just a set of golden rules to live by. It's not just a belief for myself alone and no one else. But Islam also has within it uh, the ability to address issues and problems that societies and nation states alike will face. From the individual spiritual actions to matters to do with economics or even education to name a few, Islam is comprehensive in every sense of that word. Islam doesn't measure things according to gender, class or race. There's no classifications of this within Islam. And, um, and, and, and as such, it will champion for the rights of all humanity. And that really, you know, as Muslims, sometimes when we're in our circles, whether it be in university environments or at the workplace, sometimes we get a bit, you know, shy or soft when, we, when it comes to talking about what Islam is or you know when an issue comes up on the news you kind of just sort of take the you know yeah this that kind of approach but you know for far too long we've been like this you don't you know as Muslims you know take that feel confident in your religion in your belief you know to speak up about the fact that Islam does afford um, a great status and many rights and security for women as a holistic system its textual evidences and its rich history is testimony to this fact and it does not stop there. Islam, as we will see later on in my talk, did not just come to liberate women and the people at that specific time of which it was revealed to, but it still has relevance today and beyond. To offer security and solutions to problems facing women all over the world. And certainly I can tell that all the Muslims here would vouch for that. So the question that needs to be at the center of this discussion shouldn't be does Islam oppress women or you know let's let's call for Islam to have a women's interpretation of the laws or a feminist reading of Islam 
so that you know Islam can progress and you know advance some sort of women's rights movement. No, these shouldn't be the questions that are that needs to be asked when we're dealing with Muslim women or women's rights in general. But rather, we should be asking which which system and belief can and will protect the dignity and rights of women is that current day secular liberalism which we see rife and adopted by many countries all over the world or is it Islam so I really want this to sort of be at the heart or the foundation of approaching this <laughs> topic today now perhaps you know this could be you know almost like a surprise to say that you know women that Islam champions women's rights and it's you know news but given because given that without a doubt the reality facing Muslim women whether in the Muslim world or even here in various Western countries Muslim women and their reality is a dark one some of them are afflicted with so many problems whether it is you know from forced marriages to honor killings to acid attacks and you know, be it you know the lack of access to education or healthcare, and because this is an undeniable reality, I won't say it doesn't exist and it doesn't happen um, to Muslim women. But you know, whether we hear these reports from the media, you know, somehow we immediately accept the equation that Islam, with its Sharia law and values, are behind such actions. <coughs> but even if we simply you know pause for a second take a brief study of the rules in Islam it would highlight that such actions have no basis within Islamic texts and are in fact something which is Islam is quite against these practices whatever they may be um, result from non-Islamic tribal or traditional cultural practices from particular communities and you know their cultures and unfortunately in the worst cases these practices are given credibility because some people have distorted their understanding of these Islamic evidences to justify their actions which and these traditions just harm women in addition these practices have been able to flourish and survive by the dictatorial regimes that currently plague the Muslim world and care little for the rights of any of their citizens these governments have turned a blind eye to the heinous traditional customs allowing for such crimes to go unchecked and unpunished Furthermore, these governments have also instigated injustices themselves to women. You know, rape victims languish in jails. Women face dire poverty, poor access to education, basic services like healthcare, employment opportunities, and lack to no political rights whatsoever. But just because these despotic regimes appear to have a Muslim face, a Muslim flavor, happen to have a Muslim a, you know a significant Muslim population and when these crimes are enacted you know Islam has been judged as the culprit because of that equation yet again in examining the ruling structures of these countries looking at the laws and the constitutions of these so-called Muslim countries we find them to be either monarchies or you know secular dictatorships or republics they're not essentially an Islamic Sharia state and you know therefore these ruling structures are at complete odds with what the Islamic ruling system is because of the very idea that they put sovereignty of law at the hands of human beings and not the creator God and so it becomes imperative that when we do look at these realities we should be looking at not just the reality at face value and take it at, as it is and look at what actually supports and supports the continuation of these problems and since this discussion is looking at how Islam is the origin of women's liberation we'll t jump onto a time machine if that's possible to look at um, how what the conditions and what society was like and that is about 1400 years ago to to see you know uh, and so that we can understand how Islam was so revolutionary in its ideas and laws that it became the beacon of not just women's rights but how it was a belief and a system which was out to challenge and change the norms of the societies it was around in that time and I will argue also beyond so yeah for the purposes of sticking to the theme of the talk we will just focus on what you know the status of women was like before Islam to understand and paint a picture 
of life, well, what life was like for her. <laughs> so we're going to be taking into consideration the socio-economic and political context that surrounded her. So, and I'm really sorry that I don't have slides. I realized that after I, get, I wrote the talk, I should have had presentation slides, but um, you're just going to have to put imagination caps and try and picture Arabia <laughs> in 1400 years ago. Um, okay, so the life of women um, generally during um, those times in, for, for women in Arabia and even like the bordering, the bordering countries around, um, it was one that, you know, depending on what kind of status, what kind of tribe you came from, what kind of class you came, like what class you were in society, it would be different. The treatment you'd receive would be very different. So for example, if she was from a tribe that was from a wealthy and strong and powerful family, and that particular family actually chose to honour their women and actually respect their women, then the whole tribe will defend her honour, and therefore she would receive a considerable portion of free will. And due to that honour and respect she used to receive, sometimes wars would ensue because of her. And in other words, um, she was the most decisive key to a bloody fight or a friendly peace. And although this was the case for these particular women, in general, as a society, the structure remained patriarchal in nature. And this was felt throughout all levels of society. This was what the tribal political system was dependent upon. So the leadership, of it, um, the leadership was, had rested upon the older members of the clan who were men. Most of her affairs were you know, approved by her legal guardians. So for example, in matters of marriage, um, it was not for her to decide who she married. Um, um, it was in the hands of her legal guardian, be it her father or the actual leader of the tribe. And she could not question or have a say in that marital arrangement which he has organised for her. But marriages were not the only types of relationships that existed. Other depraved relationships occurred. More often affected women who were of lower standing and from weaker tribes. And even worse, the reality for, people who, for women who were slaves. One particular relationship was, for example, where a man, and he usually came from a weaker tribe, he would send his own wife to um, cohabit with another man who came from a sort of more stronger, wealthier tribe so that maybe she could conceive a child from that relationship and therefore that child will, they had this mentality of that he could then inherit that, you know, those good, strong qualities from that tribe because they were very, the Arabs at the time, they very, very valued very much the idea of lineage and bloodline. So that was one type of relationship. And he can choose whether to keep that child or even keep his own wife. He could even just not keep her again. Things like that. Um, also, another type of relationship was that a woman, she would actually be in a relationship with 10 men or less, simultaneously and consecutively. And if she happens to fall pregnant, by, from this relationship, she'll gather all the men together and then she gets to decide who the father is and no one has a say in that decision and whoever she's chosen, he will then have to take responsibility for that, for that child. And the last particular category is where women are kept in brothels um, which would be owned by the rich noblemen of society and this would be a means for the tribal leaders to earn an income and also entertain any of their guests. Also, on the other side of things, men were able to actually marry as many women as they wanted to. Um, there was no system, there was no structure, there were no rules in terms of who they couldn't marry, in terms of who were they able to, be ma to marry, and um, there was no even guidance as to how they can even treat the woman. And more often than not, during those times, they just saw women as properties to inherit, to, to, you know, to gain so that they, they can take her assets and so, and so on and so forth. So really, they really viewed women as commodities. Um, so to further add to this picture, other societal norms included gambling, the production and consumption of alcohol, it was widespread then, um, slavery, although I might add to a side note, it wasn't just particularly in Arabia, it was at that time there were other empires like the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, slavery was widespread during these times. Um, also, common factors of the society was also female infanticide, um, which is, you know, the burying of young children, particularly girls. Although, again, not widespread, but it was a practice that maybe weaker tribes would do. Also, these people were very religious people. They, were, they believed and they practiced idol worship. 
So, um, so they were you know, very superstitious. They relied heavily on fortune telling in order to decide where to, what to do, what not to do. Um, so this is their sort of the spiritual side of things. And also, poetry was a revered form of entertainment. On the whole, poverty, hunger, and insufficient clothing were the prevailing economic features of Arabia. And as such, when Islam was revealed through the Prophet Muhammad, peace be, ho peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the various facets of life, be it the economic situation, or the social practices, or the personal beliefs that these people held onto, were to be challenged and questioned. A message that, he, that was revealed to shake the very foundations of families, tribes, and also empires. Not only was his message one that moved the hearts from the reverence of idols and the blind following of laws and desires of men to the worship of the one creator who created the universe and everything in it, giving them and us the correct tools and methods to come to terms with, this, with the existence of the creator. But he fundamentally came with a message to manifest this worship and obedience of God by challenging the very structures that society run by men had put in place to liberate all people all human beings, men and women, from the shackles of man-made oppression to the servitude of the divine power of God, leaving all affairs and all laws to the Creator alone to decide. So when Islam says, people are equal as the teeth of a comb, they are differentiated only by piety, then Islam is promoting notions of equality and the distinction between people is given to a value, a characteristic which encourages good morals and closeness to the Creator. Or when Islam says, paradise lies under the feet of the mother, then Islam is elevating the position of motherhood as not just another task in life, but a rewarding role which, be which will bear f its fruit when she raises men and women who will honor and love her. And with this, we see Islam is also emphasizing that a society needs to build strong family bonds, where people will never neglect their parents, whether they are young and healthy or until they reach their old age. Also, when Islam says, the believer who has the most perfect faith is the one whose behavior is the best. And the best of you are those who are best to their women. Then Islam is saying and commanding all people to be fair and respectful in their treatment and conduct with women who have a role with them in all aspects of life and thus closing the gates to exploitation or oppression to, of women. These are just a few of the many revolutionary statements that Islam has to offer. Statements such as these inspired the hearts and minds of many women to liberate themselves from the empty worship of idolatry and the dictates of man-made law to the worship and submission of the Creator of all men and women. So when Islam says this, are these not ideas which challenge the status quo and offer a better solution to the problems that were rife for women? Is this not an action which holds to account the evil and vice practices that occur in their society and system which supports it, a society whose actions controlled and dictated by man. And as such, to restore the true honour and protection of the women, of rights of women must have. This is the Islam that made nations embrace its ideas, laws and values in droves. The first person to embrace it was a woman, the Prophet's wife Khadija radiallahu anha. And the first person, first person to be martyred holding on to her faith while in the face of torture by her Master was a woman, Sumaya radiallahu anha. Women were at the forefront of the message of Islam, whether they were inviting their fam family and friends to it or whether they were beside the men on the battlefields. Women were empowered by Islam and its values. Women found protection of their dignity and their rights because of Islam and its laws, laws by which no man can strip away from her because at the foundation of these body of laws is the very idea of being aware and conscious of the Creator seeking paradise and the reward of which he has, which is the reward which he has promised all who are faithful. The rights prescribed to women within the Islamic texts are clear. The right to education, employment, to vote, political participation, choice in marriage, the right to divorce, the rights of citizenship are all on par with the men in society. And importantly, the right to respect and protection of her life and her honor. These are rights that are afforded to both genders in Islam. The manner in which Islam was revealed meant that women or any other member in society did not need to call for reformation or protest their way to ensure that they, that they receive these rights. Because in Islam, we don't believe that Islam needs to be reformed. 
um, we know we believe that Islam has come completely with all its details pertaining to life and so we can find that in history there wasn't the history of Islam there wasn't any record of you know people being truly unhappy and you know with the laws and you know the values that Islam imbued unlike Western societies where women often had to battle the system to secure their rights the rights afforded to women in the size of Islamic history were dependent upon Islamic rule protected by an Islamic system of governance and only when the application of this system weakened or worse still was removed in 1924 then these rights could not be guaranteed and women fell prey to the grave injustices that we see today many women worldwide would therefore argue that it has been the absence of Islam that the Muslim world is in so much strife. While Islam does not define matters by gender or class or race, however, Islam does recognize and appreciate the differences between the genders and addresses their needs accordingly. For example, because, I guess, because that Islam does have a specific aim and a specific type of society that it, sh that it hopes to build, Islam places in high esteem the protection of building strong family units and thus defines a specific responsibility for the man as a breadwinner, for want of a better word, to his family and the responsibility of the woman as a homemaker and nurturer of, her ch of their children. This is clearly set out in Islam but at the same time it does not in any way strip the woman of her ability to choose work if she, ch if she wants to do that. And one would really be naive to think that Islam would exclude women from society and from this sphere. But it must be noted that because Islam does acknowledge that her primary role is that of a nurturer, all steps will be taken first with the support of a state. You know, that to ensure that her main responsibility is for first fulfilled without it being compromised in any way. And I found this very interesting, subhanAllah, like when you know, I guess rereading into your own beliefs and values um, that, you know, if a woman does, you know, gain any wealth, whether it be through personal work or inheritance, uh, her own to be spent as she wishes with no obligation to finance any family needs. The man, however, is obliged to spend his earnings and any inheritance to not only financially maintain his wife, children or any other female relatives which is a stark contrast to the modern woman where if she does you know, work, most of it, if not all of her income, along with the man's income, is to be distributed to pay for day-to-day -day expenses from the bills and to the demanding lifestyle choices. So Islam seeks to secure a society with specific values. This is the Sharia that needs to be viewed as a whole and not as laws cut off and isolated from each other and then viewed you know, separately from the body of the laws and then without any scholarly understanding or consideration, you know, examined under a microscope with a secular liberal lens. Appreciating Islam and its values and laws needs to be done so by its own merit and to look at the manner in which it treats all its citizens by understanding their needs as human beings and uh, what type of society it aims to achieve, not by measuring parts of Islam's laws against another system with a completely different set of values and, and laws which are based on something completely different, for example, freedom or secularism, where it might appear that that particular law just does not match up. What we need to look into is what type of society Islam aims to achieve and certainly Islam does not believe in this notion of freedom or liberalism or secularism. Um, and as such, you know, we do not believe in securing individual freedoms but aim instead to protect other values in society. Values such as chastity, honour and respect of men and women alike, strong marriages and strong family units. It also believes in the cooperation of both men and women within society, in fields of education, economics, politics and societal life in general. It does not simply look at what will ensure maximum pleasure for individuals within society, but what is best for the har harmony and safety and respect for the community as a whole. What is so appealing and unique about Islam is that it places the confidence of the laws 
and obedience to them in the belief that to obey them and to live by them surpasses any other law that a human can conjure because it is a law that the creator who knows his creation best as how, to, how one should conduct themselves in life. And as such, we find tranquility and reward in such actions. It elevates the ordinary and mundane to something that is beyond this world and into pleasing the creator alone. While we see in the present day debate on women's liberation or gender equality, you know, there's this you know, pattern of repetitive and predictable arguments that are used against Muslim women and her values. Um, whether they spit the same rhetoric that Muslim women are either oppressed because of how Islam has restricted her freedoms or the other example that Islam discriminates against women because particular laws are at odds with gender equality. You know, we really see these as not a genuine concern for the welfare of women. Rather, like these arguments really, they have nothing to do with ensuring the rights of Muslim women or, you know, emancipating her from, from Islam. Or they're not even sincere attempts to have an open dialogue with Muslims to see what, you know, your values are and what the laws are in Islam pertaining to women. But rather, I will argue that these initiatives and these are ad ideas are attached to the very same notion when back in 2001, where former US President George W. Bush proclaimed that one of the reasons to invade Afghanistan was in order to liberate the women of cover. And similarly, this same idea was more you know, recently stated by former President Nicolas Sarkozy, where the ban for the niqab and burqa was not an issue of religion, but a question of women's freedom and dignity. See, I, like, but the thing is, the truth unveils itself. Um, and, and because the tr you know, truly these messages um, are not seen, like the truth unfolds itself in a manner where we do not see this sincere or genuine you know, benefit or protection for Muslim women, what are the results now? How has it improved the, the livelihood of Muslim women to say these statements? Let's talk to a woman in Afghanistan and see how the, the bringing of democracy by the tanks and the, and the bomb and the gunfire has changed for her. What are the results for saying these statements? So I would argue that these aren't for the benefit and protect, protection for the Muslim woman and her rights to be secured, but rather these are excuses and justifications used as a means to advance political and strategic interests. Both men and women are enjoyed with the same responsibilities in Islam to raise the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to call people to Islam, to enjoin the good and forbid the evil, as we saw in that beautiful verse in the Quran, of, from the Quran in the beginning of the, um, the talk. And at the same time, Islam recognizes the given realities in order to fulfill such tasks. The concept of women's liberation from the Islamic point of view is not to take the Western secular liberal experience and then apply it to Islam. Rather, Islam and its position on women is, is the idea that within its very laws and values seeks to protect her rights, her dignity and honor. This, these things are enshrined in Islam. Arguably, more than ever, Islam needs to be at the forefront in shaping today's landscape with its ideas and values pertaining to women and other facets of life. As I mentioned earlier in my talk, we really need to move away from the initial discussions, the, the reactionary discussions of, is it true, does Islam oppress women, or is this law such and such, what does this do, what does this mean? We need to move away from these discussions and start heading towards a new direction to look at, you know, to, to discuss the idea of what is the best way forward for women. Knowing very well as human beings, you know, we are all concerned about how best to live among, amongst each other, what, how best to live in a harmonious, peaceful way, a safe, a safe way. So, um, you know, where, when, where men and women can live and interact in a harmonious society, and really, I f it, it seems as though you know, this dilemma has not yet been solved. So which way of life, which system can offer this to the woman and secure her rights? Is it the current systems that we see today, be it secular liberalism or otherwise, 
Or does Islam actually have something unique and relevant to offer? Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.